Chapter 58 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ragnvald Jarl's Crusade. In 1150, the young lendermand Eindride Unga returned from Constantinople, where he had served in the Varangian Guard of the Emperor, and he could tell much about the exploits of the Varangians, and also about the Second Crusade, led by King Louis VII of France and Emperor Conrad III of Germany. 1147 to 1148. Eindrida met Ragnvald Jarl of the Orkneys, who was then in Norway, and encouraged him to lead a crusade to the Holy Land. Erling, Ormsen, Skaka, and others also spoke in favor of the undertaking, and agreed to join in it. Ragnvald agreed to go, and when it became known that he and Erling were organizing a crusade, many prominent men joined them. Ragnvald should be the leader, and Eindrida Unga, who had already been in the Orient, should act as guide for the expedition. Two years were to be devoted to preparations, and Ragnvald returned to the Orkneys in the fall. In 1152 he came again to Norway, and the ships were made ready for the voyage. They set sail from Bergen, but when they reached the Orkneys they decided to remain there that winter, as it was already late in the season. The arrogant Eindrida Unga, who, contrary to agreement, had fitted out more splendid ships than the others, was shipwrecked on the coast of Shetland, and had to get a new ship from Norway. In the summer of 1153 all preparations were completed, and Ragnvald and his followers set sail from the Orkneys with fifteen large ships. As each ship must have had a crew of 120 men or more, they were in all probably about 2,000 men. They then sailed till they were south of England, and thence to Valland, west coast of France. There is no account of their voyage until they came to a seaport called Verbon. There they learned that the earl who had governed the city, and whose name was Gerbjorn, had lately died. But he had a young and beautiful daughter by name of Ermingard, and she had charge of her patrimony under the guardianship of her noblest kinsman. They advised the queen, i.e. the earl's daughter, to invite Jarl Ragnvald to a splendid banquet, saying that her fame would spread far if she gave a fitting reception to noblemen arrived from such distance. The queen left it to them, and when this had been resolved upon, men were sent to the jarl to tell him that the queen invited him to a banquet, with as many men as he himself wished to accompany him. The jarl received her invitation gratefully, and selected the best of his men to go with him. And when they came to the banquet there was good cheer, and nothing was spared by which the jarl might consider himself specially honored. One day, while the jarl sat at the feast, the queen entered the hall attended by many ladies. She had in her hand a golden cup, and was arrayed in the finest robes. She wore her hair loose, according to the custom of maidens, and she had a golden diadem round her forehead. She poured out for the jarl, and the maidens played for them. The jarl took her hand along with the cup and placed her beside him, and they conversed during the day. The jarl sang, Lady fair, thy form surpasses all the loveliness of maidens. Though arrayed in costly garments and adorned with costly jewels, silken curls in radiant splendor fall upon the beauteous shoulders of the goddess of the gold rings. The greedy eagle's claws I reddened. The jarl stayed there a long time and was well entertained. The inhabitants of the city solicited him to take up his residence there, saying that they were in favor of giving him the queen in marriage. The Jarl said that he wished to complete his intended journey, but that he would come there on his return, and then they might do what they thought fit. Then the Jarl left with his retinue, and sailed round Thrasnes. They had a fair wind, and sat and drank and made themselves merry. The Jarl sang this song. Long in the prince's memory, Ermingard's soft words shall linger. It is her desire that we shall ride the waters out to Jordan. But the riders of the sea-horses, from the southern climes churning, soon shall plough their way to Verbon, or the whale-pond in the autumn. They went on till they came west to Galicia land, five nights before Yuletide, and they intended to spend Christmas there. They asked the inhabitants whether they were willing to sell them provisions, but food was scarce in that country, and they thought it a great hardship to have to feed such a numerous host. It so happened that the country was under the rule of a foreigner, who resided in the castle and oppressed the inhabitants greatly. He made war on them if they did not do everything he wished, and menaced them with violence and oppression. 
When the Jarl asked the inhabitants to sell him victuals, they consented to do so until Lent, but made certain proposals on their part, to wit, that Jarl Vagen should attack their enemies and should have all the money which he might obtain from them. The Jarl communicated this to his men, and asked them what they would be inclined to do. Most of them were willing to attack the castle, thinking that it was a very likely place to obtain booty. Therefore, Jarl Ragnvald and his men agreed to the terms of the inhabitants. The castle was taken, but the chief, Gudifri, or Godfred, escaped. They plundered far and wide in heathen Spainland, that is, in the part of Spain occupied by the Saracens, and they sailed then through the Strait of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean Sea. Here the wrong-headed Eindri de Unga left the expedition with six ships, and went to Marseille in France. With the remaining nine ships, Ragnvald continued the voyage. Over against Sardinia they met two very large Saracen ships of the type called Dromones. One of these ships escaped, but the other one was attacked by the Norsemen and captured after a hard fight. After this battle, Ragnvald landed on the coast of Africa, where he concluded a seven-day peace with the inhabitants, and sold the booty which he had gathered. He then sailed to Crete, where he was detained for some time by bad weather. As soon as they got favorable wind, they continued their voyage to Palestine, and landed at Acre in 1154. But soon after their arrival, they were smitten with a contagious fever, and many died. They were now so far reduced in numbers that they do not even seem to have attempted military operations. After visiting the holy places, they left Palestine for Constantinople, where they were well received by Emperor Emmanuel I. On their homeward journey, they visited Apulia and Rome, whence they returned by the customary overland route through Germany and Denmark. The visit to Verbon and the fair Ermengarde seems to have been abandoned. End of chapter 58「Chapter 59 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Second Stage of Civil Wars The Rule of Erling Skaka and Magnus Erlingsson The difference in character between the kings Inge Krokrig, Sigurd Mund, and Øystein became very marked when they grew to manhood. Sigurd was tall and well-built. He was of a jovial disposition and carried himself well among his men. But he was of a violent temper, perverse, capricious, imprudent, and hard to please. Oystein was also a well-built and athletic young man, but he was of an imperious disposition, had a violent temper, and was very covetous. The crippled Inge, on the other hand, was very meek and mild-tempered. He had also the advantage of being born in lawful wedlock. His very weakness and his gentle disposition attached to him a great number of powerful nobles who virtually ruled in his name. The most influential of his adherents was the powerful Gregorius Dogson, who reminds us of Erling Skjalgsson and Einar Tumberskjelver in earlier days. But while Erling and Einar had been the leaders of the old aristocracy in opposition to the king, Gregorius was the leader of a faction and acted as the king's representative. Inge's weakness proved to be his strength, and he became the most powerful and influential of the three kings. Sigurd and Øystein formed a secret alliance against him, and agreed to dethrone him because he was a cripple. But the alert Gregorius Dagson frustrated their plans. With King Inge he hastened to Bergen, and shortly after King Sigurd also arrived. A thing was assembled, and Gregorius appeared in gilt helmet with a great number of armed men. Inge told the people of the plot, and asked their help, which was cheerfully promised. Sigurd also addressed the thing, and said that the report of the plot was wholly unfounded, and that it had been circulated by Gregorius Dagson to hurt him in Oysting. But he hoped that he would soon meet Gregorius in such a way that his gilt helmet should roll in the dust. No hostilities seem, however, to have been seriously contemplated, but bloody encounters which took place a few days afterwards between the followers of the two kings precipitated a general fight, in which King Sigurd was killed. Some days later, King Oystein arrived in Bergen with thirty ships, but no further hostilities occurred at this time. Inge went to Trondhjem, and Oystein sailed southward to Viken. Shortly after this meeting in Bergen, Oystein made an unsuccessful attempt to surprise and capture Gregorius Dagson, and as a result the relations between the two kings grew constantly more strained. 
Inge succeeded in winning over many of Eystein's most influential adherents, and Eystein, who was less popular, revenged himself by committing many dastardly acts. Finally, in 1156, open hostilities commenced, and both kings gathered forces for a decisive struggle. Inge collected eighty ships, while Eystein had only forty-five, and when the two fleets met, most of Eystein's ships deserted, and he was compelled to flee without fighting a battle. The following year he was captured and put to death. No reasonable objection could now be made to Inge Krokrieg as sole king of Norway. According to the rule of succession, the reign of the joint kings should be a single reign, which should continue so long as any one of them lived. The sons of the deceased kings could, therefore, not rightfully succeed to the throne as long as King Inge lived. He had, moreover, been very popular, and had won the support of the greater part of the people and the aristocracy because of his mild rule and gentle disposition. But some of the followers of King Eystein refused to submit to him, and chose Hawken Herdebred, the illegitimate ten-year-old son of Sigurd Mund, as their candidate for the throne. The struggle was no longer waged for any principle. It was not even a contest between rival candidates for the throne, but a feud between hostile and rival factions of the aristocracy. The leaders of King Inge's party were Gregorius Dogson and Erling Skaka. Among the leaders of the comparatively small faction which still remained in opposition were Sigurd of Reyr, a personal enemy of Gregorius Dagsen, and Eindride Unge, who had partaken in Ragnvald Jarl's crusade together with Erling Skaka, but the two had parted as bitter enemies. The struggle was kept up by such rivalries and animosities between ambitious nobles, and new pretenders were put forward in the interest of the contending factions. Professor Sars says, in earlier days, the kings had created the parties, at least in an external way, but now the king was created by the party. The king had ceased to be anything but a name. The aristocracy had gained full control, and the only issue was which faction should wield the greater power. King Inge Krokrieg sought to strengthen his position as far as possible. He stationed Gregorius Dagson in Viken to defend the southern districts against Hawken Herdebreid and his party. He carried on negotiations with the king of Denmark, and succeeded in having his chaplain, Oystein Erlinson, elected Archbishop of Trondheim. The new archbishop was a man of extraordinary ability, and could wield great influence in his behalf in that part of the kingdom. Hawken Herdebreid's party, which to begin with was quite small, had sought refuge across the Swedish border, and when they made an attempt to capture Konghella, they were defeated by Gregorius Dagsen but they soon advanced into Trøndelagen, where they received reinforcements, and Hawken Herdebreid was proclaimed king over one-third of Norway, to which he was regarded as being entitled as the heir of his father, King Sigurd Mund. His chance of success now rapidly improved. In 1161, Gregorius Dagsen fell in a skirmish against Hawken's followers at Bevia, Bevera, in Bohuslen, a severe blow to Inge's party. The saga states that when Inge heard of Gregorius' death, he shed tears, and said, The man has fallen who has been my best friend, and who has done the most to preserve my kingdom for me. But I have always thought that we should not long be parted. This foreboding proved prophetic. In February of the same year, while Inge was in Oslo celebrating the marriage of his brother Orm Kong's brother to Ragnar Nikolas' daughter, the widow of King Oystein, Hawken suddenly marched against the city. A battle was fought on the ice of the fjord, near Oslo, in which King Inge fell at the age of twenty-six. The able and ambitious Erling Skaka now became leader of Inge's party. He belonged to one of the most powerful families, and was married to Christina, the daughter of Sigurd the Crusader and his queen Malmfrid. He had won renown as a crusader, and was at this moment the most sagacious and powerful noble in the kingdom. When he had heard of King Inge's death, he called a meeting of the party leaders in Bergen to lay plans for the future. They were not willing to submit to Hawken Herdebreid, who counted among his followers many of their bitterest enemies. They agreed, therefore, to keep the party together, and promised under oath faithfully to support each other. The most difficult task was to find a suitable candidate for the throne around whom the party could rally. In casting about among several not very available candidates, 
they finally selected the five-year-old Magnus Erlingsson, the son of Erling Skokka and his wife Christina, daughter of Sigurd the Crusader. But by this choice they set aside all rules of succession. Magnus, the son of Erling Skokka, was not a king's son, and had no right whatever to the throne. This choice, in flagrant violation of the law, was dictated by Erling's own ambition and by party interests. In order to gain additional support, Erling hastened to Denmark to negotiate with King Valdemar, who promised to aid him on condition that the province of Viken should be ceded to Denmark, and Erling, in his eager desire for power, committed the treasonable act of subscribing to this condition. While Erling was absent, Hawken Herdebride was proclaimed king of Norway at the Urething in Trundelagen, and Sigurd of Rare, one of his chief supporters, was made Jarl. Hawken stationed himself at Tunsberg, and sent Jarl Sigurd to Konghelle to guard the southern districts of Norway against Erling, but on his return from Denmark Erling seized Tunsberg without difficulty. Hawken retreated in haste to Trundelagen, and Jarl Sigurd joined him there soon afterward. In the spring of 1162, Hawken equipped both fleet and army, and prepared to meet Erling Skaka. He advanced southward along the coast, gathering men and ships in the adjoining districts, but at Vey, in Rumsdal, he quite unexpectedly encountered Erling's whole fleet. A battle was fought near the island of Sekken in the Romsdalsfjord, where Hawken fell and his forces suffered a complete defeat. Hawken was only fifteen years of age, and the saga describes him as playful and boyish, tall, broad-shouldered, and good-looking. After the battle, Erling Skokka sailed to Nidaros and summoned the Urething, where his son Magnus was proclaimed king of Norway. Hawken's party was defeated, but it was not crushed, and as the old royal line was not extinct, they were able to find a new candidate for the throne who had some legitimate claim to it. This was Sigurd Sigurdsson, another illegitimate son of Sigurd Mund, who seems to have been a mere child. He was staying in Uplandena with his foster father, Marcus of Skog, and is generally well known as Sigurd Marcus Foster. But now, as before, they were unable to cope with the redoubtable Erling Skaka. In 1163, he defeated and slew Sigurd Jarl in a battle at Rie, northwest of Tunsberg, and shortly after he captured Marcus of Skog and the young King Sigurd, and caused them both to be executed. But Erling saw that his son Magnus would find it difficult to maintain himself on the throne as a mere usurper. It was necessary to create the impression that he was a lawful king, and he hoped to secure for him an appearance of legitimacy by having him anointed and crowned. This would give him the support of the church, which would thereby officially approve his elevation to the throne. For this purpose he entered into negotiations with Archbishop Eustin Erlandson, but the sagacious and powerful prelate drove a hard bargain, and granted his request only after Erling had subscribed to conditions which destroyed both the power and the dignity of the crown. In the summer of 1164, a council of magnates was assembled at Bergen, consisting of the archbishop, the bishops, and a certain number of representative and influential men from each Logdurma. The newly elected bishop, Bran Simonson of Holar, and the great chieftain Jan Loftesson of Oda, in Iceland, were also present. Before this assembly, the seven-year-old Magnus Erlingsson was crowned king of Norway, and all questions regarding the succession to the throne were now discussed and settled. King Magnus had to subscribe to the following conditions. He surrendered himself and his kingdom for all times to St. Olaf, i.e. to the church, and promised to rule as his vicar and vassal. As a sign of submission, his crown and those of his successors should be placed as an offering on the altar of the cathedral in Nidaros at their death. By this agreement, the king virtually became a feudal tenant under the church. But his influence and independence would be still further limited by enforcing the new rules of succession which were now adopted. These almost shattered the old principles of an hereditary monarchy, since the king in many instances was to be elected, and the church was given full control of the election. When the king died, a council of magnates should be summoned to meet in Trondheim to determine whether the heir to the throne possessed the required qualifications. This assembly should consist of the archbishop, his suffragan bishops, the abbots, the hirdsjarer, and the herd, and twelve men from each bishopric, to be appointed by the bishops. 
the king's eldest legitimate son should succeed to the throne as sole king, but if the assembly found him to be unworthy, or otherwise disqualified, that legitimate son which the assembly considered best qualified should become king. If the king had no legitimate son, they might choose the nearest heir, or anyone else whom they considered well qualified. The choice should be decided by a majority vote, provided the archbishop and the bishops consented. The arrangement that the king's oldest legitimate son should inherit the throne was a good feature, as it did away with the most flagrant fault of the old system, that any illegitimate son or any bold adventurer might aspire to the crown. But this single good feature was vitiated by giving the assembly, or in fact the clergy, the power of deciding who was worthy or qualified to become king. This enabled them to exclude at will any legitimate heir to the throne, while the election of a new candidate was delegated to them. The king of Norway, the successor of Harald Harfagra and St. Olaf, could scarcely be reduced to a more impotent shadow. The aristocracy and the clergy, who had now joined hands in their effort to divest the crown of all real power, could rejoice in a complete triumph. Archbishop Oystein Erlendsson sprang from a noble family in Trindelagen. He was related to the powerful Arnunga family, and through them also with the royal family itself. According to the standards of those times, he was well educated, and there can be no doubt that he had studied in foreign lands for many years, though no record is found of it. He was in every way a chieftain, a gifted and ambitious man who set his mind on the accomplishing of great things. When he was chosen archbishop in 1157, he went to Italy, as it seems, to get the pall from the pope, but he must have encountered some difficulty, as he was not consecrated till 1161. The delay may have been caused by the struggle between Alexander III and Victor IV, who were rival candidates for the papal throne. Pope Adrian IV died in 1159, and Alexander III was elected by a majority of the cardinals, but Emperor Frederick Barbarossa would not sanction his election, and caused Victor IV to be chosen. A bitter fight was waged by the two popes, but Alexander III was quite generally regarded as the true pope. Even the new antipopes chosen after the death of Victor IV were finally forced to withdraw. In Italy and elsewhere in Europe, Oystein has seen the Roman Church in all its outward splendor, and he returned to Norway with a firm resolve that the cathedral church of his own archdiocese of Nidaros should be token by its outward appearance the dignity and power of the Church of Norway. The Christ Church which Olaf Kyrre had built was too plain and small, and he immediately commenced to reconstruct it. He began the work by rebuilding the transepts in the Anglo-Norman style in vogue at the time. A great architectural work was thus begun, which led to the erection of the magnificent Trondheim Cathedral, the grandest structure ever built in the Scandinavian north. In order to get the necessary means for so ambitious an undertaking, he increased in many unusual ways the revenues of his diocese. His income grew with the building, and the taxes were constantly increased. He made the regulation that the taxes paid to the church should henceforth be paid in pure silver, not in coin, which had been debased. This nearly doubled his income. He shipped grain to Iceland without paying export duty, and infringed in other ways on the royal prerogative. Erling Skaka was much displeased, but he had to acquiesce in these arbitrary innovations. This was, no doubt, one of the conditions on which the archbishop finally agreed to crown Magnus Erlingsson at the assembly of magnates in Bergen in 1164. Erling, who controlled the crown lands and the royal estates, found a compensation by driving his opponents into exile and confiscating their estates. When Magnus Erlingsson was crowned, King Valdemar of Denmark sent messengers to Norway to demand the district of Viken, which Erling Skakke had promised in return for the aid which he had given him. But Erling gave an evasive answer. The people of the district would have to speak for themselves, he said. When the Borger thing was assembled, the people declared loudly that they would never consent to being transferred to Denmark. Valdemar was very wroth when he discovered Erling Skakke's deceitfulness, and as Erling's personal enemies encouraged Valdemar to attack him, he sent spies to Norway to learn what the popular sentiment was. They came as pilgrims to Nidaros, and many of Erling's opponents promised to aid Valdemar. When Erling found this out, he seized those who had implicated themselves and punished them most severely. 
Valdemar made an expedition to Norway in 1165 and visited Sarpsborg and Tunsberg. But when he found that the people were almost unanimously opposed to Danish overlordship, he returned home without attempting to forcibly occupy the district. Hawk and Herdebride's party in the southern districts put a new pretender in the field against Erling and his son Magnus. This was Olaf Ugeva, the son of King Eystein's daughter Maria. He gathered formidable bands of followers called Hetusfeiner, who avoided pitched battles but levied tribute on the people for their maintenance, and exercised great power in the southeastern districts and in Viken. At one time Erling himself barely escaped falling into their hands. These bands were the forerunners of the Berkebeiner, Birchlegs, who were to play such an important part in future events. Olaf Ugeva and his followers sought support in Denmark, and Erling, who feared the powerful King Valdemar, was evidently alarmed and eagerly grasped what seemed to him an opportunity to avert the danger. While Valdemar was absent on an expedition against the Wends, Burris, one of his vassals, a descendant of King Svan Estridsson, formed a treasonable plot to overthrow him. He negotiated with Erling, who promised to attack Denmark with the Norwegian fleet. The plot was revealed in time, and Valdemar called Burris before him and accused him of treason. Burris denied the charge, but the king kept him in custody until the Norwegian fleet arrived on the coast of Denmark. This proved his guilt, and he was imprisoned as a traitor. Erling captured some Danish ships at Deersaw, in Jutland, plundered Grindhurg, Grenau, and arrived before Copenhagen. But the vigilant bishop Absalon met him with a strong force, and Erling did not attack the town. A peace was concluded between him and the bishop, and after an unsuccessful attack on Holland, Erling returned home. King Valdemar decided to punish the Norsemen for this attack on his kingdom. The following spring he sailed with a large fleet to Viken, where, according to Saxo Grammaticus, he was well received by the people, no doubt by the adherents of Olaf Ugeva. At Tunsberg the townsmen even marched in procession to meet him. But Erling arrived with a fleet, and Valdemar was forced to take to sea. His men became mutinous and wished to return home, but the voyage was continued along the coast until they came so far north that at the summer solstice the nights were as light as the day, and one can read at midnight the finest writings without difficulty sagely remarks the learned Saxo. It may be supposed that they were somewhere on the southwestern coast of Norway. As he was short of provisions, and as the resistance and ill will on the part of his men continued to trouble him, he sailed back to Denmark, but for the future he laid an embargo on all trade between Denmark and Norway. Although hostilities had ceased, a state of war still existed between the two countries. But worse than the war was the interruption of the trade with Denmark on which the southern districts of Norway were especially dependent. The people in Viken demanded that peace should be concluded with King Valdemar, and Erling sent his wife Christina, a cousin of Valdemar, to Denmark, ostensibly on a visit, but really for the purpose of quietly gaining information as to the prevailing sentiment. She was well received by the king, and Erling sent Bishop Helga of Oslo to negotiate peace. Bishop Stephanus of Uppsala also became his representative. Erling was summoned to Denmark, and the peace was concluded at Ringsted in 1170. According to the Heimskringla, the district of Viken was given to Valdemar, who in return made Erling a jarl, and gave him the district as a fief under the Danish crown. Through his selfish and unpatriotic policy, Erling Skaka had alienated a part of the kingdom of Norway, something which had not happened since the days of his prototypes, Haakon Jarl and his sons. The authority exercised over the district by King Valdemar was purely nominal, it is true, but Erling's system of statesmanship was of the most pernicious sort, and might have led to very serious consequences if he and his party had remained in power. After he had made peace with Denmark, he guarded eagerly against all pretenders, and with the eye and spirit of a tyrant he sought to exterminate the family of Harald Gila. This aroused the hostility of the Swedish Jarl Berger Brosa, who was married to Harald Gila's daughter Bergeta and henceforth his opponents found encouragement and support in Sweden. No one wielded a mightier sword than Erling Skaka. He combined craft and resourcefulness with great energy and courage, but he had the tyrant's fear, and as his heart grew harder and his methods bloodier, 
his real power decreased, and an opponent mightier than he arose to overthrow him. End of chapter 59「Chapter 60 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The English Conquest of Ireland. Events in the Colonies. After the Battle of Clontarf, the Norsemen ceased to rule in Ireland. Their military power was broken, and they submitted to the Irish kings. They continued, however, to hold their fortified cities, and as the Irish, because of incessant feuds, were unable to exercise but a nominal overlordship, they continued their commerce, governed themselves according to their own laws, and remained a distinct nationality as before. By old Irish and English writers they are generally called Ostmen, i.e. men from the east. A name still preserved in Oxmantown, equals Ostmantown, in Dublin. Giraldus Cambrensis speaks of them as a distinct people given to seafaring and commerce. Gensi Gitur Hace, Quae non Gostmanica Gens Vogator. About the middle of the twelfth century, the Irish feuds raged with their accustomed fury and led finally to the conquest of Ireland by the Anglo Normans in 1169 to 1171. The principal resistance to the invaders was offered by the fortified Norse towns, but as there was no national government and no general leadership, each town fell in turn and the conquest was easily accomplished. In 1166, Rodri O'Connor became High King of Ireland. He went to Dublin where he was hailed as King by the Ostmen, but this was scarcely more than a ceremony, since the men of Dublin were still ruled by their own king, Oskil, Oskulf. Ragnvaldsson, with O'Connor's aide Dermite MacMurcada, King of Leinster, a very restless and troublesome chief, was driven away from Ireland. He hastened to King Henry the Second of England for aid, found him in Aquitaine, and promised to do homage to him for his kingdom, if he would help him to regain it. This gave Henry a welcome opportunity to undertake the conquest of Ireland, which he seems to have planned for some time. He had already obtained a bull from Pope Adrian the Fourth the former Cardinal Niklaus Breakspear, in which the Pope permitted him to take possession of the country, and blessed the undertaking as one prompted by ardor of faith and love of religion. King Henry promised the Pope to subject the people to laws, to extirpate vicious customs, to respect the rights of the native churches, and to enforce the payment of Peter's pence. He could not leave for Ireland at once, but he gave Dermot a letter granting his vassals permission to aid him. With this letter, Dermot returned to England, and Richard Clare, Earl of Pembroke, also called Strongbow, and many other Anglo-Norman barons promised to assist him. Strongbow bargained for the hand of Dermot's daughter, and was to become heir to the throne of Leinster. In 1169, the half-brothers Robert Fitzstevens and Maurice Fitzgerald went to Ireland with a small force and captured Wexford. Strongbow followed the next year with 1,000 men and 200 mounted knights. Waterford was stormed, and a large number of the inhabitants were put to death. After celebrating his wedding with Dermot's daughter, Aif, Strongbow made haste to attack Dublin. The city was taken by a stroke of perfidy executed during an armistice arranged for the purpose of negotiating about the terms for capitulation. Askel, Haskolf, and some of the Ostmen who succeeded in escaping to the ships, sought refuge in the Orkneys and the Hebrides, but the city was sacked and a great number of people were slain. The victors made Dublin their headquarters, and it was clearly their plan to subdue the whole country. But King Henry's jealousy of Strongbow's success, and the resolute resistance offered by both Norsemen and Irish, threw new obstacles into their path. Henry ordered the barons to return to England, and when Dermot died, the people of Leinster chose his nephew as their king, and turned their backs on Strongbow, who was, thereby, placed in a most difficult situation, as he could get no further reinforcements. In the meantime, Askell, who had gone to the Orkneys, had gathered a fleet of sixty ships and a large number of warriors, who, according to Geraldus Cambrensis, wore shirts of mail and carried round red shields. The leaders of this army were Askell Roggenwaldson, and Jan Ode, 
a chieftain from the Orkneys. They made a vigorous assault on Dublin, but were finally defeated. Jan Oda fell, and Askel, the last Norse king of Dublin, was captured and put to death. Archbishop Laurentius, who still hoped to rid Ireland of the enemy, sent messengers to King Gudrud of Man and to the chieftains of the Hebrides and asked for help. King Gudrud came with a fleet of thirty ships and invested Dublin from the seaside, while the high king besieged it with an army of thirty thousand men. Strongbow, who was in command of the garrison, was brought to desperate straits, and he even began negotiations for surrender. But the siege was not pushed with vigor, and by a sudden sally from the city he defeated and drove away the Irish army, and returned with rich booty. The high king had to yield, and Strongbow took possession of Leinster as Dermot's heir. But the garrison at Wexford had been overwhelmed, and Strongbow, who saw that he could not succeed without reinforcements, hastened to England to offer his submission to King Henry II. While he was away, the Irish made another unsuccessful attempt to capture Dublin. We hear also about this time of the last Viking expedition led by the last Viking, Sven Aslifsson of the Orkneys, who undertook to capture Dublin. It is possible that the expedition was undertaken to avenge the death of Askel Ragnvaldsson, and that it was made while Strongbow was in England. The Orkneying saga gives the following account of it. They went all the way south to Diflin, Dublin, and took the inhabitants by surprise, so that they did not know till they were in town. They took a great deal of plunder and took captive the rulers of the city, and their negotiations ended in the surrender of the city to Sven, and they promised to pay as much money as he might levy on them. He was to quarter his men in the town and have the command of it, and the Diflin men confirmed this arrangement with oaths. Sven and his men went down to their ships in the evening, but in the morning they were to come into the town and receive hostages from the inhabitants. Now it is to be told what was going on in the town during the night. The rulers of the town had a meeting, and considered the difficulties in which they were placed. They thought it was a grievous hardship that they should have to surrender their town to the Orkneymen, especially to him whom they knew to be the most exacting man in the whole West. And they came to the determination to play him false if they could. They resolved to dig a large pit inside of the city gates, and in many other places between the houses, where it was intended that Sven's men should come in, and armed men were hidden in the houses close by. They placed such coverings over the pits as were sure to fall in when the weight of the men came upon them. Then they covered all over with straw so that the pits could not be seen, and waited till morning. Next morning Sven and his men arose and armed themselves, and went to the town. And when they came near the gates, the Diflin men ranged themselves on both sides from the gates along by the pits. Sven and his men, not being on their guard, fell into them. Some of the townsmen ran immediately to the gates, and others to the pits, and attacked Sven's men with weapons. It was difficult for them to defend themselves, and Sven perished there in the pit, with all those who had entered the town. When Strongbow arrived in England, King Henry was already preparing an expedition to Ireland. The Earl obtained the King's pardon by surrendering to him the Irish seaports. He did homage to him for Leinster, and accompanied him to Ireland. Henry placed English garrisons in Dublin, Wexford, and Waterford, received the homage of the Irish chieftains, and returned home. But although the Norsemen were conquered, they were not driven from Ireland. They are mentioned in the Annals of the Four Masters, 1174, and also by Gereldus Cambrensis, who states that the same year the English asked the Osmen for help against the Irish, and in a battle near the city four hundred Ostmen from Dublin fell. J. J. A. Warsaw says, Over a century later many Ostmen were yet found in the larger towns of Ireland, where they, as it appears, still preserve their Norse characteristics which distinguish them from the Irish and the English. In the year 1201 a decision was rendered at Limerick by twelve Irishmen, twelve Englishmen, and twelve Ostmen regarding Limerick church lands, churches, and other belongings, which show that the Ostmen were still so numerous that they were accounted equal to the Irish and English. Even from the year 1283 there is found preserved in the Tower of London a document issued by King Edward I, ordaining that the Ostmen of Waterford, in conformity with the regulations made by King Henry II, should be amenable to the same laws as the English who were living in Ireland. 
This shows that the Ostmen were still a distinct people. In 1292, the wine trade of the Ostmen is still spoken of in old documents, which shows that this once flourishing commerce was not yet dead, though over a hundred years had passed since the Norse towns in Ireland had fallen into the hands of the English. After the Norsemen lost their independence, they gradually mixed with the Irish and English inhabitants. The Irish annals, says Warsai, mentioned several clans which were of Norse descent, or strongly mixed with Norse blood. In the annals and genealogical tables from the Middle Ages, we find many, both among the clergy and outside, with Norse names. In the 14th and 15th centuries, we find among the canons and monks of the Christ Church in Dublin, which was erected by the Norsemen, such names as Harold, Olaf, Seward, Sivard, Reginald, Roggenwald, Ewer, etc. The old chronicler Duald Macfirbus, who wrote in the middle of the 17th century, says, And as for the greater part of the merchants in the city of Athclath up to the present day, they are of the family of Amlaib Kiran, Ola of Kvaran, and of the family of Saif, daughter of Brian Baruma, who was his wife when the Battle of Clontarf was fought. And he adds, Thus the race of the Samlab Quran, in the town of Athclaith, Dublin, is opposing the Gaelhals, Irish, of Erin. Mr. Warsaw points out that traces of the Norsemen are still found in Ireland, especially in personal names of Norse origin still in use, as Mechitric, or Shidric, son of Sigtrig, Obruader, son of Broder, Macragnall, son of Ragnvald, Ralb, Ralv, Alviv, Olav, Manus, Magnus, Harold, Harold, Ivar, Ivar, Cotter or Macotter, Otter, and others. The civil wars had a tendency to weaken the ties which still bound the colonies to the mother country. The Orkney Jarls continued to do homage to the kings of Norway for their possessions, but during such a period of weakness and confusion they could exercise sovereign authority without much interference or restraint. King Gudrud of Man and the Hebrides had long been waging war with his rival Sumerlida. In 1154 or 1155, he made an expedition to Ireland, where he defeated King Markertok's brother, and was hailed as king of Dublin. He returned to Man, but became so tyrannical that many people in the Sudries turned away from him and chose Sumerlida's son, Dugald, as king. This brought about a permanent partition of the kingdom of men in the Hebrides, 1158. Gudrid was finally defeated by Sumerlida, and went to King Inge Krokrig of Norway, who confirmed his title to his kingdom. But Gudrid deserted his suzerain in the Battle of Oslo, and joined his opponent, Hakon Herdebride. He remained in Norway till Sumerlida fell in 1164, when he returned with a large military force, and seized man and a part of the Hebrides, which possessions he ruled till 1187, while the other part of the island kingdom was ruled by Sumerlida's son Dugald. End of chapter 60Svera Sigurdsson and the Birkebeiner Erling Skaka's harsh regime and his attempt to exterminate all descendants of Harald Gille created a most determined opposition to his rule and brought new forces into the field against him. Many had no choice but to resort to armed resistance in their own self-defense, for although they were convicted for no wrongdoing, they knew that Erling was plotting their destruction, and with their band of followers they sought refuge in mountains and forest where they led a life almost like brigands in constant want and danger. They were called Berkebeiner, birch legs, because they were sometimes forced to wrap their feet in birch bark for want of shoes. In their fight against the tyrannical Erling and the puppet king Magnus, the Berkebeiner stood forth as persecuted patriots, who under the guidance of an extraordinary leader brought about a revolution, and revived the lost ideal of a united and independent Norway. The Berkebeiner first rallied around Eystein, a grandson of Harald Gille. He was small and fair-faced, and was nicknamed Mela, i.e. Maiden. Jarl Berger Brosa, who was married to Brigida, a sister of Eystein's father, 
promised to aid him and furnished him with both men and money. Eystein and his men spent two years in Viken and neighboring districts, and in 1176 he sailed to Nidaros, captured the city, and was proclaimed king. He had assembled an army of 2,400 men, and with this force he crossed the mountains into southern Norway. But in January 1177, King Magnus Erlingsson met him at Rie, where Eystein was defeated and slain. His followers were scattered, and many of them sought refuge across the Swedish border. A more formidable leader now appeared on the scene to champion the lost cause of the Birkebeiner. This was Sverre Sigurdsson, who claimed to be an illegitimate son of King Sigurd Mund. The Sverre saga, which gives a full, though not impartial, account of King Sverre's life and deeds, states that Unas Kambari, a brother of Bishop Hroy, Ro, in the Faroe Islands, married a Norse wife named Gunhild in the reign of the sons of Harald Gila. She bore a son who was called Sverre, and he was thought to be the son of Unas. When he was five years old, he was sent to the Faroe Islands, where he was reared by Bishop Froey, who educated him for the priesthood and ordained him as a priest. Sverre did not know who was his real father until he was twenty-four years of age. At that time his mother Gunhild went to Rome, where she made the confession that Sverre was not the son of Unas, but of King Sigurd Mund. This confession was laid before the Pope, and she was commanded to inform her son of his real parentage. She returned to Norway and sailed thence to the Faroe Islands, where she told Sverre that he was King Sigurd's son. The next year he went to Norway to see what he could do, spoke with the king's bodyguard, and learned to know the general sentiment, but he did not disclose his plans or his identity. At last he made his way through Gautland to Jarlberger Brosa, where he arrived three days before Christmas, weary and exhausted. The Jarl's wife, Brigida, was a sister of Sigurdmund, and he confided his troubles to her and Jarl Brasa, but they would not help him, because they had promised to support Oystein Mela, his cousin, and because they had heard that Erling Skaka had sent this young man to them in mockery. But Sverre stayed with them during Christmas, and spoke to them constantly about his plans. After Christmas he went to Vermland to visit Sigurdmund's daughter Cecilia, the wife of Folkvid Lagmand, and she received him with great joy. Rumors had already reached him of Oystein Mela's defeat and death, and the Berkebeiner, who had learned that Sverre, a son of Sigurd Mund, was staying in Vermland, sent messengers to him and asked him to be their leader. At first he refused, because the Berkebeiner were small, disorganized bands in want of everything, but when they threatened to kill him to gain King Magnus's goodwill if he did not join them, he consented. With a band of seventy men, he started for Viken in southern Norway, and the number increased on the march till he had four hundred twenty men. A thing was called, and the Berkebeiner hailed Sverre as king, though he was opposed to assuming the royal title under so unfavorable circumstances. He soon resumed his march, following the Swedish side of the border to Trindelagen. He kept strict discipline, and forbade his men to plunder. On these weary marches he was deserted by all but his most resolute followers, so that his little force again dwindled to seventy men. With this small band he suddenly appeared before Trondheim, but the city was well garrisoned, and the commanders marched against him with a force of fourteen hundred fifty men. Sverre retreated, but bewildered them with circuitous marches until he had secured some reinforcements. He then attacked them in a position well suited to his tactics, and won a decisive victory. He seized the ships in the harbor, and defeated several small squadrons which were coming to join the fleet in defending Trondheim. King Magnus's lenderman fled, the city surrendered, and Sverre was received by the people in festive procession to the chiming of bells. He assembled the Erething, twelve representatives from each of the eight Filker, and was proclaimed king of Norway according to St. Olaf's law that is, according to the old law of succession, which did not exclude a king's illegitimate son from the throne. The law of 1164 was not recognized, and King Magnus would be treated as an usurper. Archbishop Oystein Erlinson, who is not mentioned in connection with these events, must have been absent from Norway at this time, a circumstance which probably enabled Sverre to seize Trondheim. The rumors of the events in Trondelagen had reached Magnus and Erling, who hastened with their fleet northward along the coast. Sverre did not await their arrival, but marched across the mountains into Gudbrandsdal, and advanced to Lake Musen, 
where he found Magnus's lendermand stationed with 1,400 men and 18 ships. He did not venture to attack them, but sent a detachment to the Ransfjord. The vessels on that lake were seized and the local forces defeated. But Orm Kongsbrother, Magnus's chief lieutenant in southern Norway, was advancing from Viken with a strong force. With great difficulty, Sverre succeeded in transporting some of the small vessels overland from Ransfjord to Mjösen. With these, he attacked the Lendermand, surprised and defeated them, and captured all the vessels on the lake. All the districts of Oplanena now submitted to him, but as his force was so small that he could leave no garrisons, he was unable to hold permanently any of the territory which he had won. For some time, this indecisive guerrilla warfare continued with forced marches and daring exploits, in which Sverre proved himself a peerless leader, but his forces were too small to risk a decisive engagement, and his daring ventures represented no substantial progress. King Magnus and Orm Kung's brother, who had united their armies in Viken, soon compelled Sverre to withdraw from Oplanena. In the winter of 1177, he crossed the mountains in an effort to capture Bergen, but the city had been warned. A fleet was patrolling the coast, and at Voss an army confronted him which he could not hope to cope with. He had no choice but to retrace his steps across the snow-covered mountains. For weeks they struggled through the pathless wilds without fire or shelter. Horses and military stores were lost, and many of his men perished from cold or exhaustion before they finally reached the settlements in Valdres. But even here he could not dare to tarry, as all avenues of escape might be cut off. He continued his retreat to Usterdalen, where he camped during Christmas, but when he learned that Erling Skaka was approaching, he withdrew across the Swedish border. Sverre began the campaign of 1178 in Jemtland, where he forced the Jams to swear allegiance to him. It seems to have been his plan to secure a base of operations from which he might attack Trondhjem, which again had fallen into the hands of King Magnus and Archbishop Oystein, but he entertained no great hope of success. When he reached Namdalen, a district north of Trondhjem, he assembled his men and discussed the situation with them. Three courses, he thought, now remained open. One, to make a voyage north to Hologoland, obtain friends and ships, and then sail south to Bergen to see if he could win a victory over his foes. The second course, to leave the land and sail to the Western Isles, where there were good prospects, he considered, of obtaining support. The third course, to go on a plundering expedition to Ireland or other Western lands, for he was of the opinion that the popularity of King Magnus and Erling Jarl would grow less the longer they ruled over the country. But at present, he said, their power is great, and to contend with them will be a hard matter. The Birkebeiner would not listen to Sverre's advice, but thought that they could capture Trondheim now as easily as they had done before. But Archbishop Oystein was at home, and urged the Trunders to resist the Birkebeiner to the utmost. I have been told, he said, that their numbers are few and their ships small. The men, moreover, are in an exhausted and wretched condition. It befits not Yemen and merchants to give up their clothes or goods to such thieves and evildoers as Sverre has scraped together. King Sverre risked the attack, but he suffered a crushing defeat and narrowly escaped losing his life. After this mishap he again sought refuge in the mountains, but marched slowly southward towards Viken. When King Magnus heard of the approach of the Berkebeiner, he hastened to meet them with a strong force. Sverre, who saw that he could gain no further support until he gained a victory over his opponents, told his men that he would rather die now in an honorable battle with King Magnus than to be constantly driven from pillar to post. At Herta Bridge he resolutely attacked King Magnus's forces. Both the king and Orm Kung's brother were wounded, many of their men fell, and they retreated from the field. Shortly afterwards he also succeeded in destroying a part of King Magnus's fleet at Konghella. These successes inspired his men with new confidence, and he stationed himself in Viken, where he could obtain both provisions and reinforcements. From this time on his fortunes began to mend. In the fall of 1179 he returned to Trondheim, where he defeated the forces of King Magnus, captured the city, and took ten ships. But this victory was in no way decisive. The great leaders, King Magnus, Erling Skaka, Orm Kung's brother, and Archbishop Hoystein, were staying in Bergen, and when they heard of Sverre's success, they collected a large fleet with which they intended to attack him as soon as the new campaign should open in the spring. When winter was passed, Sverre sailed southward with the fleet which he had collected, 
but off Stott he met Magnus, Erling, Orm, and Eystein with so overwhelming a force that the only question became how to avoid falling into their hands with the whole fleet. To save himself, Sverre steered for the open sea. In a fog, his pursuers lost sight of him, and as they were unable to determine what course he had taken, Orm, Kongsbrother, and Eystein were sent with a part of the fleet to protect Bergen, while King Magnus and Erling proceeded to Trondheim. Sverre was already in the city when they arrived, but they landed without opposition, and took up a position in the Kalviskind, a peninsula formed by the river Nied and the sea, while Sverre held the opposite bank of the river. After some fruitless parleying, Sverre marched away, and the rumor spread that he had retreated into the mountains. So confident was Erling Skaka that he would not return, that he allowed his men to feast and drink in the town, and did not heed the warning of his lieutenants that he should keep good watch. Sverre, who well knew the significance of the combat now imminent, had hastened into Guldal to collect reinforcements. On the night of the 18th of June he returned to Trondheim. He reached the city at daybreak, halted a few moments, and addressed his men, telling them how much depended on the battle which was to be fought, and what they might gain if they were victorious. I will now make known to you what is to be gained, he said. Whoever slays a lenderman, and can bring forward evidence of his deed, shall himself be a lenderman. And whatever title a man shall cause to be vacant, that title shall be his. He shall be king's man who slays a king's man, and he shall receive good honor beside. King Magnus's sentinels had noticed the approaching Birkebeiner, and the war trumpets called the men to the standards. The first onset was so fierce that Erling's men were forced backward. His standard was cut down, and he received a halberd thrust into his abdomen, and fell mortally wounded. King Magnus's forces broke into disorderly flight. In rushing past, Magnus noticed his father. He bent down and kissed him, and said, We shall meet again on the day of joy, my father. Erling's lips moved, but he could not speak. Magnus had to flee for his life, and Erling soon breathed his last among his enemies. Magnus boarded a ship and sailed away from Trondheim. His defeat was overwhelming. Ten lendermen had fallen, and half of his herd. The decisive battle between the two parties had been fought. Erling Skaka was buried near the south wall of the Christ Church, but his burial now lies inside the much larger Trondheim Cathedral, which was erected later. After the Battle of Nidaros, Magnus fled to Bergen, which was held by Archbishop Eystein and Orm Kongsbroder. Sverre fortified Trondheim with palisades, and took special care to strengthen his fleet, knowing that this branch of the military service would be of the greatest importance in the future. Magnus and Eystein spent the winter in Viken, and the following spring they assembled again a large fleet and sailed to Trondheim to try conclusions with the victorious Sverre. He proposed that they should make peace, that he and Magnus should rule as joint kings, but the offer was rejected. On the 27th of May, 1180, another battle was fought at Heveldena in Trondheim, in which Magnus was again defeated. His army was torn up, six lendermen fell, and Magnus retreated to Bergen with the remnants of his forces. But his victorious pursuers followed close on his heels, and as he was unable to offer any effectual resistance, he abandoned the struggle and fled to Denmark. Archbishop Eystein also left Norway and sought refuge in England. King Henry II was no special friend of prelates, but he nevertheless treated the archbishop with due respect and assigned him the monastery of Edmundsbury for a residence. But he granted him but a small allowance, probably because he did not want to make it appear that he was supporting King Sverre's enemies. The great defeats had weakened the aristocracy, but had not destroyed their power of resistance. Not only could the chieftains still raise forces in nearly every district in the kingdom, but they did not hesitate to seek the support of the king of Denmark, who was willing enough to aid them as long as they were opposing the representative of a strong national government and an independent Norway. Sverre had indeed gained control of the whole kingdom, but his task was only rendered more difficult, as he had to defend it against the combined attacks of domestic and foreign enemies. In the spring of 1181, while sailing from Bergen to Viken, he suddenly encountered King Magnus and Orm Kongsbrother, who came from Denmark with a fleet of 32 large ships. His own fleet was much smaller, and he fell back to Bergen, where a bloody naval engagement was fought. By superior generalship he won the victory, but the battle was not decisive, as both sides suffered heavy losses. 
To know where the next attack would be made was impossible. Sverre hastened to Trondhjem, garrisoned the city, and marched overland to Oslo for the purpose of defending Viken. But Magnus attacked Trondhjem, overwhelmed the garrison, and captured Sverre's whole fleet of 35 ships. When Sverre returned to aid the city, Magnus sailed away to Bergen, and Sverre could not pursue him for want of ships. The situation had once more become critical, as everything which Sverre had gained in many hard-fought campaigns was lost by one fell swoop. But he wasted no time in mourning his losses. With characteristic energy he set about repairing them as far as possible. The necessity of strengthening the defenses of the city so that it could be held by a garrison of reasonable size had become apparent. He greatly strengthened the fortifications and erected a castle which he called Zion, generally known as the Sverreborg, where he stationed a part of the garrison. In the spring he caused palisades to be set up, so that a complete line stretched from the castle along the sea coast, then inland along the guild halls, and over the Eyra, Oiren, across to the river, and along the river to the quays. A catapult was fixed on Brateren by the sea, and a blockhouse was erected close to the sea. In the meantime, Sverre had collected twenty small vessels, and with a strong north wind he set sail for Bergen. Magnus's ships were riding at anchor in the harbor. He entered quite unexpectedly, cut the anchor ropes, and towed the fleet out into the fjord, while a vigorous assault was made on the city. King Magnus fled after a short resistance, and again sought refuge in Denmark. Archbishop Oystein, who had returned to Norway after a three years' exile, was in Bergen at this time. He tendered his submission, and was allowed to return to his archdiocese in Trondheim. The terms imposed by Sverre are not known, but it is quite certain that the constitution of 1164 was annulled, and that Oystein acknowledged him to be the rightful king of Norway. Archbishop Oystein's political career was now ended. For eighteen years he had helped to keep Magnus Erlingsson on the throne. He had suffered defeat, he had languished in exile, and the great work which he had dreamed of accomplishing in his new archdiocese had been interrupted. He longed to return to his beloved Nidaros, and the last few years of his life were devoted to the erection of the great Trondheim Cathedral. Before his exile he had rebuilt and greatly increased in height the transepts of the Christ Church which Olaf Kyrre had erected, but during his sojourn in England and Normandy he was greatly impressed by the beauty of the Gothic architecture of the magnificent cathedrals which were built during this period. When he returned to Trondheim he raised the choir of the Christ Church, and built a new magnificent choir in the Gothic style. To this was joined the octagonal ladies' chapel, a minor choir, retro chorus. The main altar was placed in the choir proper over the grave of St. Olaf. The ladies' chapel contained a minor altar for the Virgin Mary in her image, richly ornamented with precious stones. Underneath the walls of the ladies' chapel is the holy St. Olaf's well, which, according to the legend, welled up on the spot where St. Olaf's body was buried. It is forty-four feet deep and walled with stone from the bottom. The reconstructed transepts, the new choir, and the ladies' chapel were probably finished when Oystein died in January 1188. The work of erecting a new nave in harmony with the other parts of the cathedral was not begun until 1248. After receiving aid from King Knut Valdemarsson of Denmark, Magnus returned to Norway in the spring of 1184 with 24 ships and a force which must have numbered about 3,000 men. At Fimreita in Norrfjord, a narrow arm of the Sognefjord, he met King Sverre, who at that moment had only 14 ships and a force not exceeding 2,000 men. The fierce battle which began in the afternoon of the 15th of June lasted till midnight. 2,160 men are said to have fallen, but Sverre was finally victorious. King Magnus perished together with the flower of the aristocracy, and Bergen and the districts of southwestern Norway, which had given him the most loyal support, hastened to tender their submission to King Sverre. After the battle, Magnus's body was brought to Bergen and buried in the Christ Church. Fair speeches were made over the grave. Nicholas Sultan spoke, a brother of King Sverre's mother, and one of the most eloquent of men. The king himself made a long speech, in which he said, We stand here now at the grave of one who was kind and loving to his friends and kinsmen. 
though he and I, kinsmen, had not the good fortune to agree. He was hard to me and my men, may God forgive him now all his transgressions. Yet he was an honorable chief in many respects, and adorned by kingly descent. The king spoke with many fine words, for he did not lack them on whatever course he was bent. The burial of King Magnus was put in careful order by King Svera. Coverlets were spread over the tombstone, and a railing was set up around it. End of chapter 61「Chapter sixty two of History of the Norwegian People, Volume One by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Sverre's Reign. While the struggle between Sverre and Magnus had the appearance of a personal contest for the possession of the throne, even a casual observer would soon discern that a revolution had been set on foot in which the Birkebeiner, or common people, under the leadership of Sverre had undertaken to wrest the people from the aristocracy and the clergy. Sverre could assert his right to the throne only according to the old rule of succession as the illegitimate son of Sigurd Mund, while Magnus Erlingsson wore the crown by the special arrangement of 1164, which virtually transferred the sovereign power to the church and the nobility. With Sverre on the throne, the era of puppet kings and the rule of the nobility would be at an end. The constitution of 1164 would be overthrown, and a regime would be inaugurated to which Sverre himself gave the keynote in his speech at the funeral of Erling Skaka. Times are greatly changed, as you may see, and have taken a marvelous turn, when one man stands in the place of three, of king, of jarl, of archbishop, and I am that one. Sverre would rule in the spirit of Harald Harfagra and St. Olaf, as the sovereign of a national and independent kingdom exercising the highest authority in ecclesiastical and state affairs within the realm. But although he had gained the power and was fully resolved to use it, he did not exercise it in a harsh or arbitrary way. With the instinct of a true statesman, he took care to gradually lessen the influence of the nobility, to put more power into the hands of the common people, and to organize the administration and the judicial procedure in such a way as to lodge the power more firmly with the central government, and leave less to the whim of the individual or the caprice of fortune. We have seen that the local administration was originally controlled by the herser, or hereditary chieftains. The lendermen who succeeded them were appointed by the king, but exercised to a large extent the same power. They controlled the local military organization, and exercised extensive police power. They attended the thing in the capacity of police officers to maintain peace and order, and they were still regarded by the people as their chieftains. They usually belonged to the old aristocracy, and although they exercised their power in the name of the king, they were quite independent of royal authority because of their rank and influence. The Armind were the king's real representatives in local administration. They were overseers of the royal estates, collectors of taxes, and procured the necessities for the entertainment of the king and his herd when he stayed in their district. They had to meet at the thing to maintain the king's cause. They should see to it that the thing was assembled at the right time, and should arrange for the election of Nefendarmen, or members of the log thing. It was their duty, also, to keep in custody persons under arrest, and to inflict on them the punishments imposed by the thing. But they were of low birth, often they were freed slaves, and they were neither loved nor respected by the people. When determined resistance was offered, they were often unable to execute efficiently the duties of their office. In such a case, the Lendermand might from sheer kind-heartedness condescend to aid them. But as the Armand stood under the supervision of the king, not of the Lendermand, we may be sure that such assistance was both rarely and grudgingly given. In cases of special lack of efficiency in the local administration, or for special purposes, the king would appoint one of his trusted men as his Sisselmand, or personal representative, clothed with an authority superior even to that of the Lendermand. But such appointment was not permanent, except in faraway districts like Hologoland and Jemtland. The Sisselmend were royal officials, men of standing and ability. They had all the duties and powers of the Ormend, except that of acting as overseers over the royal estates, which was considered menial service. They also performed many of the duties of the Lendermand. They had police power, collected fines and taxes, and assembled the thing, where they proclaimed new laws in the king's name. They acted as prosecutors and defended the people in their rights over against the clergy. As royal deputies, they had numerous duties and possessed great power. 
The appointment of Sysselmand grew more common in the 12th century, but during the period of the civil wars, while the king exercised only a nominal authority, this institution could not be of very great importance. Not till in King Sverre's time can it be said to have developed into a general and permanent system of local administration. After the Battle of Nidaros, he appointed Sysselmand in the whole of Trondelagen. The office does not seem to have been established everywhere in the kingdom in his reign, but it was rapidly extended under his successors. The Armen continued for a time to act as subordinate officials under the Sysselmand, but as the more important functions of their office were delegated to him, they became superfluous and gradually disappeared. The Lenderman institution was left intact. Sverre pursued a conciliatory policy and left the Lenderman in undisturbed possession of their lands and powers. He even appointed many of them as his Sisselmain. But in the civil wars their ranks had been greatly thinned, and Sverre rewarded many of his own men by elevating them to this rank even if they were men of humble birth. Many of his followers he married to the widows and daughters of those who had fallen in the wars. He thereby attached the Lenderman class more closely to himself, and by appointing them Sisselmaind, they became royal officials dependent on the king, while the office of Lenderman, stripped of its old significance, gradually became an empty title. Of no less significance was the change made by King Sverre in the hitherto obscure office of Lagmand, Old Norse, Logmother. Much difference of opinion has prevailed regarding the origin of this institution in Norway. R. Kaiser, P. A. Munch, and Frederick Brandt held that the office of Logman was created by Sverre, that before his time the word Logman signified a man well versed in the law, who exercised no prescribed function in the judicial system. Conrad Maurer held that the Logman were a separate class, distinct from the Lendermand and the people. He points to the very closely related institution of Logsigmand, Logsogmadr, the leader of the thing in Iceland, and the Logmand in Greenland, the Faroe Islands, and Jantland, and finds that the existence of this institution in the Norwegian colonies can only be explained by supposing that it also existed in the mother country. Ebbe Hertzberg does not fully agree with either view, but holds that the office of Logmand dates from an earlier period than Sverre's reign which is shown especially by Sigurd Ronason's noted case, where the Logmander mentioned several times. Then King Oystein asked the Logmand if it was law in Norway that Bunder should judge kings. The Logmand answered that suits between kings would have to be tried at the Erething. When the laws in course of time became more numerous and complicated, few knew them well, and those who were to render decisions at the thing would naturally ask the opinion of those who were well versed in the law. In course of time, says Hertzberg, the word Logmand came to designate one who was well versed in the law, who at the thing was requested to give his opinion as to the law, and thus for the occasion acted as Logmand. This view must be regarded as the one which is best supported by the evidence of the old writers. Several such Logmand were present both at the Filkish thing and the Log thing, but they were not officially appointed. Archbishop Oystein attempted also to give the clergy control over the courts of law by making a regulation that at the thing the law book should be read by a priest, who would thereby get the office of principal logmand. King Sverre's attention had probably been directed to this important office by Oystein's attempt. He reduced the number of logmand and made them royal officials appointed by the king. The duty of the logmand should be to give his orskurt, i.e., to state the law according to which the lagrette should decide the case. It became customary also to bring cases before the logmand outside of the thing, and to settle them according to his orskart, or legal opinion. This relieved people of the burden of expensive litigation at the thing. At first, the contesting parties would not necessarily have to abide by the orskart of the logmand, but by a law of 1244, a fine of three marks was imposed on anyone who disregarded the orskart. The logmand had become a high judicial functionary appointed by the king. He exercised great influence over the judiciary, and tended to strengthen greatly the monarchic principles. Over against the hierarchy, King Sverre asserted the principle of the sovereign power of the king in all affairs within the realm with more uncompromising vigor. He not only annulled the agreement of 1164, but also all the laws inspired by Archbishop Oystein by which this prelate had sought to enhance the privileges of the clergy at the expense of royal power. The struggle of the church soon waxed very bitter, since Oystein's successor, Archbishop Eric, 
who had been elected in spite of Sverre's protest, was an avowed opponent of the king and a most determined advocate of church supremacy. The archbishop based his claim on the new code of church laws called Golfjolder, a revision of the older laws, completed under the supervision of Archbishop Oystein, in which many privileges were granted the church. Sverre refused to acknowledge these laws, and appealed to the laws of St. Olaf as they were found in the old code Graugos, from the time of Magnus the Good. He declared that Erling Skaka ought not to have broken the laws of Olaf the saint to have his son appointed king. For Magnus was not rightly chosen, inasmuch as never before since Norway became Christian has one been king who was not a king's son, nor yet in heathen times. King Sverre regarded as unlawful usurpation every innovation introduced by Erling Skaka and King Magnus, and would force the church to surrender its illegally obtained privileges. One subject of dispute between them was the old law and practice by which the king and the yeomen should build churches, if they wished, on their own homesteads and at their own cost, and should themselves have control of the churches and appoint priests thereto. But the archbishop claimed rule and authority in each church as soon as it was consecrated, and over all those whom he permitted to officiate in them. The king requested that the law should hold, but the archbishop refused. Svera also demanded that the taxes which the archbishop levied in his diocese should be reduced to what they had been before the time of Magnus, and that he should not keep more than thirty armed followers, the number prescribed by law. The archbishop, he said, has no need of a bodyguard, or of warriors, or of a ship all bedecked with shields, and he so far exceeds what the law says that he sails in a smack having twenty benches manned by ninety men or more, and bedecked with shields from stem to stern. We, Berkebeiner, will call to mind the ship sent by the archbishop to attack us under the Hatterhammer, and that we thought the same too heartily manned by his huskarls. So too in Bergen when we attacked the fleet, the archbishop's ship and his company were much readier with their weapons to fight against us than with the king's company. I should think it more righteous before God if the archbishop had no guardsmen beyond what is lawful, for no one will plunder him or the church property, and if he used the cost to set men to the quarries to transport stone to do mason's work, so as to advance the building of the minster for which preparations have already been made. The archbishop made an arrogant reply, and Sverre declared that within five days he would outlaw the men which he might have in excess of the prescribed number. The archbishop thereupon fled to Denmark. Another controversy arose over the election of bishops. Sverre claimed the right to control their election, and maintained that in early Christian times the bishops were chosen by the king. This practice had been adhered to in the time of St. Olaf, and even in the days of Oystein, Sigurd and Inga, the sons of Harald Gila. The concessions made by King Magnus he wholly disregarded, and the right of the clergy to elect the bishops, which had been conceded in principle even in the reign of the sons of Harald Gila, he interpreted to mean that in case two or more kings ruled jointly and could not agree on a candidate, the clergy might elect. He says about the right of election in his speech against the clergy, We have heard these people, the clergy, state that the king has surrendered this right and has given it to them. But any one will perceive, whom God has given understanding in the bosom, that even if the king would relinquish this power he could not do so, inasmuch as he must account for it to God himself. For God will call the king to account for everything which he has given the kingdom, and in like manner we will hold the bishop responsible for everything he has given the bishopric. One cannot alter it for the other by giving or receiving, as this is contrary to God's own disposition and command. When a new bishop was to be elected for the diocese of Stavanger, the choice fell on Nicholas Arneson, a half-brother of King Inga and Orm Kongsbroder. Nicholas was a staunch adherent of King Magnus and had fought against Sverre in the Battle of Ilavoldena. The king, who feared that he would use his influence to support the archbishop and to strengthen the hierarchic party, refused to sanction the election. But the cunning Nicholas wrote a letter to the queen, and she interceded for him. Sverre yielded to her pleadings and sanctioned the choice. The bishop-elect was transferred to the Diocese of Oslo, and in later events he comes into the foreground as the most sinister figure in Norwegian history. His misfortune has been that little is known about him save what is told in the Sverus saga. His misfortune has been that little is known about him save what is told in the Sverus saga, which was written by his enemies, and all posterity has learned to regard him as the treacherous arch-conspirator, the very incarnation of evil. This view is no doubt both erroneous and unjust, 
but it finds its explanation in the fact that he became the real organizer and leader of the hierarchic aristocratic opposition party known as the Bagla, and fanned into flame the passions of party spirit and civil strife. Nicholas exhibited talent mixed with cunning and selfishness. He must have been educated, but he had probably no specific religious training. His martial spirit indicates that he lacked true religious feeling, and he seems to have been partisan and narrow. His career shows him to have been a chieftain of the old type rather than a bishop. The Sverus saga relates that it happened one day while Svera lay in the Seimsfjord that his men rowed him in a cutter close under the land. Bishop Nicholas explained to him, Why don't you come on land, Svera? Are you not willing to fight now, you renegade? You think no life equal to that of robbing and harrying. Now I will wait for you here. Behold my sleeve, and with that he held up his shield. The mitre and staff which by the Pope's command I bear against you are this helmet and sword. I will carry these weapons until you are slain or driven from your realm. However, we may regard the words quoted by the saga writer. They probably give a correct picture of the warlike prelate in martial array, hostile and bitter in his opposition to King Sfera. That the position taken by Sfera would produce a renewed conflict with both the hierarchy and the aristocracy might be expected. Archbishop Eric was well received in Denmark by the powerful Archbishop Absalon, who gave him all possible aid. He instructed Abbot William of Ebelholt to write a letter to the Pope in Eric's behalf and describe the king's action against the Archbishop and the Church. The letter emphasized especially that Sfera had requested the Archbishop to crown him, but he had refused to do so except with the consent of the Pope. This had made Sfera and his whole army angry as he claimed that in such an affair he was not dependent on the favor of the pope, since kings might let themselves be anointed wherever and by whomsoever they pleased. The letter received no immediate answer. Pope Clement III died in April 1191, and the new pope, Celestine III, was too much occupied with affairs in Germany and Italy to devote much attention to the faraway province of Norway. In 1193 the two archbishops sent men to Rome with a new letter, and now the Pope issued a bull in which he placed Archbishop Eric and his successors under his apostolic protection, confirmed all rights and privileges of the Norwegian clergy, and made new regulations. The bull concludes with the threat that whoever resists it shall lose his authority, his title of honor, and shall be excommunicated. Sverre did not long enjoy peace even after the overthrow of the Hecklungs and the death of Magnus Erlingsson. New armed hosts were constantly placed in the field against him by the nobles. These strong bands, which were usually recruited from the most lawless elements, did much harm, and Sverre's ability as a general was often taxed to the utmost to defend the various sections of the kingdom against them. But their operations were planless raids, which the saga gives undue prominence, and pictures with unnecessary minuteness of detail. After the Battle of Fimreita, the followers of Magnus took from the Hovedur Monastery at Oslo a monk known as Jon Kuvlung, whom they hailed as king, claiming that he was a son of Inge Krokrig. The clergy and aristocracy supported him, and as all adventurers and lawless elements joined his standards, Sverre found it difficult enough to cope with the Kuvlungs, as these bands of rebels were called. They captured Bergen and took the Sverreburg, which the king had built in the city. Another time they seized Trondheim and destroyed the Sverreborg of that city, but they were finally taken unawares by Sverre in Bergen. Jon Kovlung fell, and he was proven to be a simple impostor, the son of a man by the name of Peter and his wife Astrid. Even before the Kovlungs had been scattered, a new band of rebels and marauders, the Varbelgs, made their appearance in Marker, a border district of southeastern Norway. Their leader, Sigurd, an Icelander of low birth, claimed to be a son of King Inge Kokrig. He was defeated and slain by the angry farmers, but after the fall of the Kuvlungs, the chieftains put forward another pretender, Vikar, a mere child, who had been brought from Denmark and was said to be a son of Magnus Erlingsson. The Varbelgs were finally defeated at Bristein by the men from Tunsberg, and Vikar was slain. During the next two years, 1190 to 1192, no band of rebels disturbed the kingdom and a joint crusade to the Holy Land was organized in Denmark and Norway. After Jerusalem had been captured by the Turks in 1187, Pope Gregory VIII preached a new crusade against the infidels, and the three most powerful sovereigns in Europe at that time, 
Frederick Barbarossa of Germany, Philip Augustus II of France, and Richard Coeur de Lyon of England became the leaders of the Third Crusade. The papal legates also came to Denmark with letters from the Pope, and met King Canute Valdemarsson at a diet assembled in Odense. The great noble Esbern Snara arose and urged the Danes to forget their domestic quarrels, and to use their strength and resources to rescue the Holy Sepulchre. Many Danish nobles took the cross and sailed to Konghelle in Norway, where Ulf Alflavnes, one of King Sverre's ablest Berkebein chieftains, lay ready to join him. Warriors from all the three Scandinavian countries joined in this crusade. Bernardus Thessararius says, Norsemen, Gurtar, and the other inhabitants of the islands which lie between the north and the west, tall and warlike people, despising death, came to armed with battle axes and sailing on round ships called Snechjar. Ulvaf Laubnus became the leader, and he was the most experienced seaman. They first sailed to Bergen, where the Danish chieftains visited King Sverre and asked his forgiveness for having aided the rebel bands which had risen against him. Sverre readily granted them his pardon, embraced them as his friends, and wished them a safe journey. On their voyage across the North Sea, they suffered much from stormy weather, and when they reached Friesland, they decided to leave their damaged ships and journey overland. They marched along the Rhine and finally reached Venice, where they chartered a ship to transport them to the Holy Land. They reached Palestine in September 1192, just as Richard Coeur de Lyon had made a truce with Saladin, and was about to depart for home. They could, therefore, take no part in military operations, and after visiting the Holy City and the River Jordan, some returned to Constantinople, where they were well received by the Greek emperor, Isaac Angelus, and his Varangian guards, while others returned by way of Rome. Ulf Aflafnes is not mentioned in later events in Norway, and it is possible that he lost his life on the expedition. The brief period of peace which followed the overthrow of the Kuvlungs and Varbelgs was but a lull before the storm. In the spring of 1193, a new band of rebels had been organized. They were called Oisjäger because they had assembled in the Orkney Islands. Halkel Jonsson, who was married to Roggenhild, a sister of Magnus Erlingsson, Sigurd Erlingsson, a son of Erling Skaka, Olaf Jarlsmog, a brother-in-law of Jarl Harald Madadsson of the Orkneys, and Bishop Nicholas Arneson were the leaders of this new uprising, and the boy Sigurd, a son of Magnus Erlingsson, was their candidate for the throne. After successful operations in Viken, they sailed to Bergen and tried to capture the city, but they were unable to take the Sverreborg, and on Palm Sunday the following spring, King Sverre defeated them in the Battle of Florevog, west of Bergen. Halkel Jonsson, Sigurd Erlingsson, Olaf Jarlsmog, and the pretender Sigurd Magnusson lost their lives. King Sverre went to Viken and summoned before him Bishop Nicholas, who had to admit that he was implicated in the rebellion. To appease the irate king, he agreed to crown him. Sverre summoned the bishops of Hamar and Stavanger to meet in Bergen, where he was crowned by Bishop Nicholas, June 29, 1194. He also caused an English clerk, Martin, to be chosen Bishop of Bergen to succeed Bishop Paul, who died before the Battle of Florevog. In the summer of the same year, the Pope excommunicated Sverre, and on the 18th of November he also published a bull of excommunication against the Norwegian bishops, which should take effect if they continued to show obedience to the king. Sverre summoned the bishops to meet at a council of magnates assembled in Bergen to confer with him about the situation. They all promised to remain faithful to him, and it was decided to send messengers to the Pope to place the situation in Norway in its right light. Bishop Nicholas Arneson seems to have protested his faithfulness to the king, like the other bishops, but as soon as he had returned to Oslo, he went to Denmark, joined Sverre's enemies, and received absolution from Archbishop Eric for having crowned him. Jarl Harald Madadsson of the Orkneys was also present in Bergen to obtain King Sverre's pardon for having tolerated the Oistjäger in his dominions. The king granted him pardon, but did not let him escape unpunished. He confiscated the estates of those who had taken part in the uprising, and separated the Shetland Islands permanently from the Jarldom of the Orkneys, and joined them to the kingdom of Norway. These islands were henceforth governed by a royal Sisselmend. End of chapter 62
Chapter 63 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Berkebeiner and Bagler. King Sverre and Pope Innocent III. Sverre had shown that he could cope successfully with rebellious bands of the kind which had hitherto opposed him. His enemies saw that no hope could be pinned on future efforts of that sort, and Archbishop Eric and Bishop Nicholas Arneson, who were in Denmark at this time, undertook in 1196 to unite the supporters of the aristocratic hierarchic principle into a strong party called the Bagler, from Bigal, Bakulas, equals Krolsjör, in a final effort to overthrow the king. Archbishop Eric had become blind, and Bishop Nicholas became the sole and real leader of the new party. No bloodier civil war had ever been fought in Norway than the struggle which now began between the Bagler and the king's party, the Birkebeiner. King Sverre was placed in a most trying position. He had gained the throne by the aid of the common people, the Birkebeiner, but he now found himself opposed by the most opulent and powerful aristocracy as well as by the pope and the clergy. The people were, moreover, divided geographically. The Bagler gained the support of the southern and western districts, while the Berkebeiner controlled only Trindelagen and the northern districts. The struggle between the Berkebeiner and Bogler is a parallel to the contest between Welfs and Ghibellines in Germany, the only difference being that Sverre was opposed by nearly the whole nobility. The Bagler appeared in Norway in 1196, and reinforcements were ready to join them. They took Viken and assembled the Borgarthing, where the pretender, Inge Magnusson, whom they claimed to be a son of Magnus Erlingsson, was proclaimed king. The lenderman Halvard of Sostad, in Oplandene, joined them, and when Bishop Thora of Hammer died in February 1196, they chose Ivar Skjalga, one of their own party, to succeed him. By his remarkable skill as a strategist, Sverre was able to defeat the Bagler at Oslo, but the victory was of no avail, for they soon captured Trondheim, destroyed the Sverreborg, and seized his fleet. Bergen was burned, and one district after another fell into their hands until they controlled the whole coast. Only the filker of Trindelagen proper still remained in Sverre's possession. He seemed to be hopelessly defeated, and Bishop Nicholas could say with a boast, Priest Sverre now holds no more of Norway than a single ness. It would be a very fit lot for him to govern the parts of Eira outside the palisades, and be hanged there on the gallows. We Bogler care very little, I should suppose, where he goes with his sea rams that he has got together in the town. Before the Trunders receive any good from them, I expect all their buildings will be charcoal. We will roam over the fjord as we please, in spite of them, quite free from fear, for they have no force to bring against us. To make a desperate situation seem still more hopeless, Sverre was at this time attacked also by the powerful Pope Innocent III. This great pontiff, who succeeded Celestine III on January 8, 1198, made all the monarchs of Europe tremble, and in course of time the kings of Aragon, Portugal, Poland, and England had to bow in submission, and acknowledge themselves his vassals. In the quarrel between Philip of Swabia and Otto IV of Germany, he claimed the right to examine, approve, anoint, consecrate, and crown the emperor-elect, if he be worthy, to reject him if unworthy. Nothing could escape his attentive eagle eye, and he was determined to humble the refractory King Sverre, as he did humble every prince who resisted him. In the fall of 1198, the storm broke loose in earnest. Innocent placed Norway under interdict, declared Sverre to be excommunicated and deposed, and hurled the most violent anathemas against him. He also sent letters to the kings of Denmark and Sweden, and to Jarl Berger Brosa, in which he recounted Sverre's crimes, and asked them to arm themselves in defense of the churches and the clergy, and to overthrow this monster, and thereby earn God's reward and the gratitude of the Pope. None of the bishops dared any longer remain loyal, and an opportunity was given, not only those who were at heart disloyal, but all the indifferent and faint-hearted to sever their allegiance. But Sverre could yet count on his war-scarred Berkebeiner, they placed him on the throne, and had followed him in all his campaigns. They feared no one, not even the Pope in distant Romaborg, and their religion was not of a kind to make them over-scrupulous in doctrinal matters. 
they trusted in their swords and clung to their leader with a faithfulness which had been their forefathers' prime virtue of old. King Sverre's courage rose with the danger, and his clear intellect sought out the loftiest and most effective means to neutralize the effect of the Pope's attack. He would fight the hierarchy with their own weapons. In answer to the Pope's anathema, he published his speech against the bishops, a remarkable document written in the Norse language, in which he appeals with great eloquence and consummate skill of argument to the Norwegian people, places before them the principles involved in the controversy, shows them the fallacies of the clergy and the arrogance of their claims, and asks them to judge. He compares the church to the human body whose members have their special functions. Christ himself is the head, the church is the trunk of this body. The eyes should be our bishops, who should point us to the right way and the safe road, free from all erring paths, and should moreover have a careful oversight of all the members. The nostrils should be the archdeacons, who should perceive the scent of all the perfume of righteousness and sacred truth. The ears should be the deans and provosts, who should hear and decide causes and difficult suits in holy Christianity. The tongue and lips should be our priests, who should preach to us sound doctrine, and themselves afford good example by their conduct. The heart and breast should be the kings, whose duty lies in solicitude, in deliberating and in acting, in emboldening and defending all other members. But, he continues, now exists the evil that all the members suffer chains in their nature, and each forsakes the office and service which it should perform. The eyes look sideways and see dimly. The same scales have fallen upon the eyes of our bishops that fell on the eyes of the apostles the night when God was taken. The same drowsiness and heaviness has come upon them, and they see all things as in a dream, where they distinguish neither clear light nor true appearance. The nostrils perceive only a stench, and not a perfume or sweet smell. The ears are now dull of hearing, and can hear neither truth nor good sense. Indeed, truth is neither heard nor seen. Our bishops and other rulers, who should watch over Christianity, are blinded by covetousness, excess, ambition, arrogance, and injustice. There have now arisen bishops such as those whom God himself slew aforetime, Hophni and Phineas, sons of Eli, high priests in Shiloh, who did violence to the holy sacrifices which the people would offer to God, and seized with wrong and robbery all his offerings and holy sacrifices from God's holy people. And it has now come to pass that in the same manner our tithes and charitable offerings are demanded with threats and ban and excommunication. We are urged to build churches, and when they are built we are driven from them like heathens. We are urged to undertake the cost, but we are given no rule over them. Sins and offenses into which men fall are used as rent-producing farms. Sinners are not chastised with right punishments, as everyone is at liberty to compound for his sins if he wishes, for silence is at once kept when money is offered. We are deprived of some of our property with the sanction of the law, but where the law fails to apply, it is taken unjustly and by laying charge against us. And the wealth that is obtained and amassed is removed out of the country on an evil errand, for it is transmitted to Rome to purchase excommunication and anathemas, which are sent to our land as recompense for our Christianity and the consecration of churches. These are the gifts and presents brought to us in return for our tithes and other property. We are given gall to drink instead of wine, and poison instead of God's blood. After having indicted the hierarchy in this strain, he says that he does not blame the Pope, who knows no more about what happens in Norway than in other distant lands, but he blames the bishops and the clergy, who have misrepresented things to him. He quotes from the decretals of the Popes to prove that an unjust decree issued by the Church cannot hurt the innocent person against whom it is directed, but recoils on those who issued it. To the same effect, Pope Galasius bears witness in the same cause when he speaks. An innocent man subjected to ban and anathema shall pay the less heed to it, because a misplaced ban injures no one before God and Holy Church nor weighs upon him. He shall not seek absolution to be released from the ban, for he knows himself guiltless and not subject to it, inasmuch as it was unjustly pronounced. These examples, and many others, bear witness that wrong judgments cannot injure us, though the deceitful wickedness of our clergy has had the power to put us to shame, for they flee from us and from this land as if we were heathens. Either the wise rulers of the Holy Church in Christendom have pronounced no excommunication, though they have been urged, or else excommunication has been pronounced, 
and it has certainly fallen upon those who by injustice and wickedness requested it, and has not fallen upon us, who certainly deem ourselves innocent, and certainly believe ourselves free from all excommunication. He urges those who are not guilty of treason or of spreading false reports to remain loyal, and asks those who may be implicated in wrongdoing against the king and the nation to depart from those evil ways. All should know, clerical and lay, that the clerical leaders are not sent over God's people to tread scornfully upon their necks, to cast shame in their teeth, to regard them as good to be pillaged and wrongfully plundered of their goods. Still less are they sent over God's people to turn them away from God, to hell, as into the mouth of the ravenous wolf, either by wrongful ban and anathema or by false persuasion. In discussing the power of the king, he shows by quotations from holy scriptures and the decretals that royal power is divinely instituted, and that he exercises the highest authority in church and state by God's appointment. So great a mass of examples show clearly that the salvation of man's soul is at stake when he does not observe complete loyalty, kingly worship, and a right obedience. For kingly rule is created by God's command, and not after a man's ordinance and no man obtains kingly rule except by divine dispensation. A king would not be more powerful or mightier than others if God had not set him higher than others in his service, for in his kingly rule he serves God and not himself. Now, inasmuch as duty binds him to answer to God himself, and to render an account of his protection and care of holy church, according to the cause just quoted, and as duty binds a minister of holy church to be obedient to the king, to afford him hearty worship and a guileless loyalty, therefore we cannot understand with what reason our clergy wish to remove the king from the oversight which he should have in holy church, and for which God requires him to answer, when we certainly know that men of inferior rank to the king have to exercise power in holy church. For knights and guardsmen and even yeomen have oversight in holy church if they are patrons of churches. There are three cases in which a man comes to have such oversight in holy church. The first, if he inherits an estate after his father or mother or other kinsmen, and the upholding of the church goes with the inheritance. The second is when a man buys an estate, and the upholding of the church goes with the lands which he buys. The third is when a man builds a church at his own pains and costs and endows it with the lands for its future upholding. It must now be made clear so that all may fully understand what oversight it is which those whom we have just mentioned lawfully exercise in holy church according as it is said in sixteen causa et ultima questione e justum causae, and found in other places in the writings of the apostles, popes themselves. This oversight in holy church has to be exercised by the sons, grandsons, and other fit heirs of the man who built the church or has been its upholder. Those who are rightful heirs shall have a care that no one through deceit or transference remove anything which the upholder of the church gave it at the outset. That which was set apart for the maintenance of the priest at the beginning shall so remain, and that which was set apart at the beginning for tar, for lights, and for vestments in the church shall so remain. And if the priest makes any change in what was thus set apart at the beginning, so that the church is injured thereby, then shall the patrons whom I have just named make the matters known to the bishop, and ask him to devise a remedy, if they themselves are unable to devise one. And if the bishop will not devise a remedy, or if he himself does such things as those I have mentioned, then shall the patrons of the church make the matter known to the archbishop, and ask him to devise a remedy. If the archbishop will not devise a remedy, or if he himself does such things, then shall the patrons lay the matter before the king, and cause him to rectify it by the authority which God has placed in his hands. Now, this bears witness that the king is set above all other dignitaries. For the king has here to direct the bishop or archbishop to do justice, if they themselves will pay no heed to it. This, be it said, relates to direction and guardianship of holy church, and not to those other violations of law which might occur in secular matters. How great is the king's power in secular matters may thus be seen, since he sits even in the highest seat of judgment in matters relating to holy church, which would have been thought, if men had not heard this quotation, to lie under the direction of the bishop. He shows that it is usually the bishops, and not the kings, who lead the people into errors in religious matters. It may now be seen whether the king is to blame, and claims their rights to rob them of their dignity, or they quarrel with the king's honor and wish to deprive him of it and render him honorless. 
And if this unrest turns into heresy, as seems too likely, heresy and the profanation of Christianity will be seen to proceed from a source whence they have aforetime proceeded. We know few instances where kings have originated heresies, but we know many where kings have overthrown them when bishops have originated them. You may now hear the names of those who in various ways have been heretics. Then follows an exposition of the fallacies of many ecclesiastics who have been regarded as heretics. Among them, Arius, Bishop of Alexandria, Macarius, Bishop of Antioch, Donatus, Bishop of Numidia, Tertullian, and Pelagius. But the very worst, the cause of most harm, was called Nicholas Advena, a disciple of the Lord himself. He was afterwards bishop in Cirkland, Saracenland, and is now known as Mahomet. Professor P. A. Munch thinks that Svera especially emphasizes the name of this reputed founder of Mohammedanism because he bears the same name as Bishop Nicholas Arneson. Not many kings will be found who have originated heresy, for kings ever talk of their realm, of their kingly rule, and the defense of their lands. Bishops are appointed to proclaim truth and Christianity, and whether they preach in church or at the assemblies, things, they declare before the people that all they preach must be followed. To fail in carrying out all they command is wrong, they say, and opposed to Christianity. Let these encroachments now cease which for a time have found place among men, and be just to one another. When both parties observe what stands in the holy writings, there is freedom for both, but when they wish to transgress what is written, they practice unrighteousness and will be rejected by God, by good men, and by equity. The document sets forth clearly the doctrine of the divine right of kings in opposition to the claim of Pope Innocent III, that the rule of the whole world had been given to the Pope, and that no king could reign rightly unless he devoutly served Christ's vicar. It was clearly the intention that this document should be read in the churches and at the things wherever this could be done, as many copies of it are known to have been distributed. In this speech, King Sverre not only exhorts his people to remain loyal, but he instructs them as to the legitimate power and the proper sphere of activity of king and clergy. His logic seems to have disconcerted his opponents, and the people listened as to a man inspired. Many of the Berkabiner who had left the king returned to their old allegiance. Bishop Nicholas was henceforth called the heretic, and his party the excommunicated Bogler. The king had been able to awaken the people's patriotism and to turn public sentiment against his opponents a more signal victory than could be gained by arms. Sverre succeeded in maintaining friendly relations with the neighboring kingdoms in spite of the letters sent by the Pope. King Knut Valdemarsson of Denmark did not attempt to attack Norway, though he had lost his supremacy over Viken, and King Sverker of Sweden remained friendly. His son Karl married Sverre's daughter Ingebjörg, and Sverre himself was married to the Swedish princess Margaret, daughter of King Eric the Saint. Jarl Berger Brosa remained friendly, and Sverre made his son Philip Jarl of Uplanena and Viken, and kept him at his court. Even with regard to the relation of the neighboring powers to the kingdom of Norway, the mandate of the Pope had produced no startling effect. In the winter of 1199, Sverre stayed in Trondhjem, where he was busily engaged in building a new fleet. Each of the eight Filker of Trondelagen had promised to build one large war vessel, and he remodeled many merchant vessels into warships. In the spring he left Trondheim with the new fleet, and met the Bagler in the Stundenfjord near Frosta. A fierce battle was fought, in which pardon was neither asked nor granted. The Bagler were defeated, all their larger ships were taken, and many of their chieftains fell. But Bishop Nicholas escaped to Denmark, and did not return to Norway while Sverre lived. Some of the Berkabiner pursued the fleeing Bagler northward, and recovered Hologaland, while the king himself with the main fleet proceeded southward to Viken, where he spent the summer. He had now regained control of the whole kingdom, but the Bagler were not yet annihilated. In the winter of 1200, while Sverre was staying in Oslo, great forces from Oplanena, Viken, Telemarken, and Tunsberg joined in an attack on the city. The campaign was well planned, and the enemy was approaching the town from different sides when Sverre became aware of the movement. Now, as many a time before, 
he went in disguise to the enemy's lines to learn their plans, and he set his men to cut a passage through the ice-bound harbor, so that the fleet might be extricated in case of defeat. He found that three armies were converging on the city, each one larger than his own. One had already gained the mountain heights east of the town, another was marching up the fjord on the ice, and a third was approaching from the west. Sverre's strategic skill and the superior discipline of his veterans enabled him to keep the armies apart and to defeat each in turn, but the struggle was long and desperate, and the victory could not have been decisive as Sverre left Oslo and sailed to Bergen. The Bogler also attacked Bergen and Trondheim, but they met with small success. Before the winter was over, the king began a new campaign against them in Ronrique and the southeastern districts of Norway. He forced them to retreat and placed strong garrisons in Viken. They made their last stand in Tunsberg, where one of their ablest leaders, Ryder Sendemand, entrenched himself in the citadel of the town, which was erected on a steep mountain height. Sverre could not take this strong citadel by storm, and in September 1201 he laid siege to the place with 1,000 men. After five months, Ryder had to surrender, and Sverre, who was always ready to show clemency to his defeated enemies, pardoned the whole garrison and cared well for the half-starved men. Ryder was ill for a long time, and Sverre kept him at his court, and gave him the best care and medical attendance. Thus, says Munch, this prince, who was excommunicated and decried by a political party among the clergy as an infidel, showed a conciliatory Christian spirit, and a humaneness which his opponents would scarcely have shown under like circumstances, and which in that age was extremely rare. But he showed that herein, as in so many other respects, he was far in advance of his times. With the surrender of Rydar Sendemand at Tunsberg, the war with the Bagler may be said to have ended and Sverre returned victorious to Bergen. He had freed all parts of the kingdom from foreign overlordship, he had successfully resisted the encroachments of the hierarchy, and the attacks of the Pope. He had wrested the power from the aristocracy, and had re-established the sovereignty of the crown in harmony with the monarchic principles of Harald Harfagra, Olav Tryggvason, and Olaf the Saint. But he was not to enjoy the fruits of his victory. He fell sick at the siege of Tunsberg, and returned to Bergen only to die. There is a tone of sadness in the words which he spoke on his deathbed. The kingdom has brought me labor and unrest and trouble, rather than peace and a quiet life. But so it is that many have envied me my rank, and have let their envy grow to full enmity. May God forgive them all, and let my Lord now judge between me and them, and decide all my cause. He passed away on the ninth of March, 1202, and was laid to rest with elaborate ceremonies in the cathedral at Bergen. King Sverre was one of Norway's greatest sons. His character was of the highest type, combining courage with prudence and perseverance. He was witty and eloquent, wise, just, and humane, great as statesman and general, noble and amiable as a man. His saga, which was written by a contemporary, characterizes him as follows. King Sverre was most polished in manner. He was low of stature, stout and strong, broad of face and well-featured. His beard was usually trimmed, and his eyes were hazel in color, set deeply and handsomely. He was calm and thoughtful. He was most eloquent in speech, and when he spoke the ring of his voice was so clear that though he did not appear to speak loud, all understood him, though they were far off. He was a seemly chief as he sat in his high seat grandly dressed, for though his legs were short, he sat high in the seat. He never drank strong drink to excess, and always ate but one meal a day. He was valiant and bold, very capable of enduring fatigue and loss of sleep. In comparing him with his supposed father, King Sigurd Mund, the saga writer further says of him, Svero was steadfast and calm careful in the choice of his friends, staunch and even-tempered. He was true to his word, reserved, sagacious, and conscientious. End of chapter 63